filmmaker, Julia Mintz. <laughs> Just uh, obviously a incredibly powerful film, uh, really, re really beautifully made, um, and a lot to talk about in terms of the making of it. But uh, just wanted to start with, um, you've made a lot of films about bravery and resistance uh, against odds. Um, what put you onto this film, in this particular story? This film really was, I think, a product of what I didn't know, and. You know, I was raised, I went to public school. I was raised on the biography of Anne Frank and, um, well, the misconception that, you know, America liberated <laughs> and kind of saved the day. And, um, and then I came across a story of a young girl who dug herself into a ditch and blew up a train headed for the front lines. And I thought, ooh, you know, who's this? Jewish Joan of Arc, I want to make a film about her. And then I very quickly learned that there were 25, 30,000 people who actually did this. And I knew pretty swiftly. I remember actually, I was on the phone with Michael Barenbaum, who is the former director of the United States Holocaust Museum and creator. And when he said, yeah, there are 25, 30,000, I was like, what? <laughs> And I remember I was in my kitchen and the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I thought, all right, I have some work to do. And that was over a decade ago, actually. And I knew that I was really creating something that was against time. And so I just, as fast as I could, I read everything I could. And in between productions of other films, I've done all sorts of stuff over the past decade, I would go and find another person that I could interview and go talk to and I'd shoot the interview and every time after I shot an interview I was like, okay, whew, got that. And then, you know, it was, it was a pretty remarkable journey, both personally, soulfully, and professionally. Of course. Um, and so, the, the, how did you track down the people that you got? which were all incredible, each of them in, incredible storytellers in their own way and revealing more than just the story of, the, of their resistance but the, the, humanity, the humanity that's involved both in, in, in every direction and the loss of humanity and, and what happened. Um, wonderful storytellers and the way that you married uh, their storytelling, which was incredible in its own, to the images that you had. Um, not only the still images, but uh, and I wonder how you got a hold of, first of all, how did you find the people? the people that you got? Well, I'll tell you a favorite story. Okay. So Michael Stoll, who is wearing the blue shirt in the film, he says, if I'm not for me, who is for me? Right. Um, and he talks about how the humanity walks out. Um, Michael was one of my last interviews uh, because I tried to interview him for five years or maybe longer. I called him, he said, no, thank you. Then I changed my voice, then I pretended I was somebody else, <laughs> and he said, no, thank you. And then I tried again, and he said, no, thank you. And then, you know, meanwhile, he's like well into his 80s at this point, and late into his 80s. And, um, and then I finally met Tevya Bilski, who, I'm sorry, Robert Bilski, the son of Tevya Bilski of the Bilski Brigade, and Michael's family was with the Bilskis. And he was in sort of a peripheral group and in the Bilskis. And Robert Bilski said, tell him Robert sent you. So I called and I said, hi, I'm a friend of Robert's. Oh, Robert, how is he? I thought, OK, good. <laughs> and anyway, I got invited to dinner. And after dinner, he said, OK, you can interview me. OK, fabulous. One thing led to another, interviewed him. So now, bounce forward to this summer, Michael Stoll is still with us. And he was able to join us for a screening at the Mahewi Theater in the Berkshires. 500 people showed up for that screening. And so Michael, at the end of the screening, came up on stage. And there was this incredible, like, so much beautiful gratitude just coming at him. And Michael was on the stage, and he was wearing his medals and kind of <laughs> waving like he's on some fabulous float. And it was really one of those aha moments. So Michael and I are sitting here, and we're talking. And I said, Michael. I want to tell you a story. That was me who called, you know. <laughs> so I'm doing the big reveal, right? And I said, and then finally Robert, and Robert was in the audience. And I said, and then finally Robert, blah, blah, blah. And he said, it wasn't that. He said, I wasn't ready. Oh. 
And, and he was the last interview that you got? He was. So, and you, did you try telling him that you'd interviewed some other people and that they were <laughs> forthcoming or any of that? Yeah, and yeah. So, how did, so you found him through the, whatever sources you found yeah. him through, but the other people that you got, how did it you was find really, that? I mean, it's sort of this funny thing where you think you find somebody, I mean, as a documentarian, we always think we find the stories and depends on your spiritual belief or how you see the world, but usually we learn that the stories find us and our people find us along the way, you know, so that's a great story about, you know, Michael and I'd actually interviewed his sister um, too, and I thought, all right, I'll get to him through that. Didn't <laughs> anyway, um, it was just all like one thing led to another. Actually, Gertie Boyarski in the red sweater. I was with my brother-in-law uh, by marriage, and I was working. He's an astrophysicist. My background's pretty geeky. I was working at NASA, and he and I worked at NASA together quite a bit. And I said, hey. I just came across this amazing story about this Jewish girl who dug herself in a ditch and I'm gonna make a movie about the Partisans and isn't it amazing and I never knew this story and there were all these people and I'm going on and on. He said, yeah, my aunt Gertie was a Partisan. Wow. So that was pretty cool. And so Gertie ended up being one of my very early interviews and um, so I guess I'm related to her. And so, you know, it's just, it was all these kinds of things. I mean, I've interviewed several dozen people for the film. And the film is really a collective of their stories. In fact, the stories that are told in the film are absolutely meant to be representative of the whole. And even though I wanted so desperately to include so many that ended up on the cutting room floor, I really crafted the film to be, to be the telling of their collective experience. So when Gertie talks about her virginity, it was, you know, there was. There was, <laughs> the way she says that. You know, it's like, it is the whole. And when Michael talks about humanity walking out on you, or Isidore talks about circumcision and his battle with God, like these are collective stories told through the singular voice. So when I was crafting the film and writing the script, I had, you know, <laughs> multiple binders all over, it took over, I don't have a big house. <laughs> and, uh, and actually I cut this film in my attic. So someday I'm gonna have to um, post some pictures of how this film was crafted. Anyway, and you know, I, I would circle the themes that showed up over and over again, and then the stories that resonated, and then I tried to represent them as such. And then I purposefully intercut them so you would understand that it was a collective experience from different points of view. I think that worked really, really well because uh, different themes that would come out and that, that were questions I think for all of us is like, okay, well, how do they survive? How do they sleep? And we would get the stories from different people on how they slept mm -hmm. and how do they eat and how do they get food? And we would get the stories of those and they would sort of echo each other, but it became the story of all of them by the fact that they each had, although they were separate, they each had similar stories about different things. And the issue of faith, I mean, you know, right away you hear about the pork and the pigs and, and so forth, and then the circumcision and the issue of faith. I didn't lose my faith, but my humanity was out the door. And, you know, and, the, and the, the honest relief of being able to kill some Germans um, and being reduced to their level, but at the same time, it just, just sort of wonderfully Isn't that represented. It's heartbreaking. Oh, it's very like heartbreaking. In those moments, you know, when I'm crafting and cutting the film, and, you know, my goal for the film was to create an experience. I mean, as you saw, Right, it's only the partisans that get to speak in this film. And as a filmmaker, as a first time director, you know, taking this journey and making that choice to not have the narrative led by accomplished, brilliant historians, but to allow the partisans to speak was really a difficult decision because it really made it hard to get folks behind me, you know, as the writer and the director, and as you know, my first time and at the helm. And it was just, the film spoke to me from that, from its first conception, I knew that's what I was doing. And I think that that, because of that, when I went to interview people, I was very much focused on the idea that this was our oral history and the tradition of, you know, what I've learned from Native American history and you know, that we really are passing something down, like our elders are passing their stories to us, and they weren't just stories of horror, it wasn't just stories of the Holocaust, it was stories of our humanity and how we have to protect it and how we have to guard it. 
and to understand that our threshold for all that we're capable of or what we think we're capable of is really quite different. And that through making this film, what I wanted to leave the audience with was not just a deeper empathy, but a, an understanding of not just their spiritual and personal elasticity, but our own. You know, like really like, wow. Okay, so maybe my, my, my capacity is so much grander than I could even conceive of. And through that, be inspired and empowered to do the good work that we need to do, especially now. Well, the lessons are, are very strong. And I think that what you said before is that your, your own spiritual path, your path and your growth through this, the journey you're on, and the way you introduced the film in terms of that Faye gave you the, the photos and she said the story is now yours, and then you said the story is now ours. And then the film finishes with, uh, I'm not sure, the red sweater woman, what's her name? Gertie. Gertie, and saying, why did I survive? Why did I survive? And so that I could tell the story. Um, and that's just so compelling. And, and in, in, in the way she kind of holds her gaze, right? You're just like, OK. No, and she's Thank you. <laughs> and she's straight up amazing, because she starts out with, I was catered to. I was you know, at, at top of the line. And, and, the other, and I guess it was Michael had the radio. We were, you know, the whole village would come to listen to their radio because they were they were well off. So I did enjoy. Whoop, am I gone? I think you're there. I did enjoy um, when I was making the film. One of the things that I really loved was it isn't right. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. Um, one of the things, thank you, that I really loved was, you know, kind of as a writer, you always want to. You, you want to weave stories together, and you don't want to bang people over the head with anything, but some of the storytellers and some of the ways that the stories came together, I loved, like Michael talked about the radio and how they would dance, and then, you know, another, like <laughs> eight hours later in the interview, he talks about listening um, to the front line and how he put the ear to the ground. And I was like, oh, this sort of stays with him, you know, the sound and the listening or Gertie talking about in early on in the interview and in her happy life and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and then the way it kind of comes back where she's like, and I for a little from the pig's mouth, you know? So you get these sweet, like, kind of reprieves, right? Isidore with the wire and the shoes, and then he's ripping the wire out of the train. And it's subtle, but what I love so much about the interview process, I conducted all the interviews in the film, was that it's just a reveal, you know, people's characters are so exciting. I mean, these interviews took place sometimes over days. I mean, literally, I would spend days with them and hours and hours and hours, and I'd bring my flatbed scanner, you were asking about the images, and I'd bring the scanner and I'd scan all their photos. You can kind of see that a little bit in the credits. And, and I loved the way different facets, different traits of people's personalities, like, I'm gonna die with my clothes on, and then, the way, you know, she's this tough little girl and she finds her way back to that resiliency over and again. And um, it's just so interesting to have that, what a gift, right? That I get to go out and listen to people and hear their stories and sort of delve deeply for hours and, well, and then get to kind of create this so I can share it with you all. And you did create it. It's, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but it's a, it's a gift to us. Uh, from uh, being able to get some of those details that reveal not only character, but they reveal the real day-to-day -day humanity, the, the boiling her underwear with the bandages, um, and those kinds of things. And, you know, picking out of your teeth, the, the different little small things of life and survival that are in extremis, and that, that really tells the story. Um, I, I wanted to say also, from the modern age, um, the, uh, the idea that the partisans, that, that they wanted to get the collaborators fast, because the collaborators had, sh had as he said, they had always been anti-Semitic, but now they had the power. And that's something that we have to be aware of today as we see what's going on, and somebody gets licensed to be anti-Semitic, and suddenly it's revealed that they always were. Um, you talk about listening, and I want to talk about the score, because the score was one of the really compelling parts of the storytelling. So can you talk to us a little bit about, about how you came up with the score? Oh. Sure. <laughs> Which one is good? Do you have a good one? Oh, I got a good one. Okay, got a good I got a good one, one too. We got good We're ones. We're good. Um, so yeah, isn't the score great? <laughs> I love the score. So the score is such a fantastic compilation of talented musicians and me being the biggest 
pain in the bleep <laughs> imaginable. Um, I am not a musician, but I love score. I, um, I really believe in the nuance of score and, and, and how it works within a film and the reprieves and the different instruments having different characters. And um, there, was, there was a collection of composers that I worked with and just really, and my editor, brilliant Tim Cooper, he was really a music editor too. And we would finesse every little piece. I mean, really worked with it. And um, I don't know what I can say other than it was painstakingly designed and implemented. And I'm actually grateful to the new Story Partners Foundation, Steven Spielberg's new foundation, because uh, I had an opportunity. I have received many grants and the funding on this film. I love the funders because like $18 at a time, I kid you not, 36, 18, 300, 360. And it took a village and a city and it still does. I mean, we're still fully independent, doing everything we can at each turn. And so this beautiful list is growing. But there was a grant that um, we wrote, actually my co-producer is here, Zen, will you put your hand up so people can say hi to you? Big shout out to Zen. <laughs> she helped me write that grant and we were able to get this wonderful grant that we got to go back in with the composers who had previously written music for me, but we got to go back in and rework that music with the kind of grace and beauty and time that was so essential to bring it to life. Oh, it was fantastic, yeah, it's awesome. and also, and with the score, the sound design, because where you yeah. had to light up gunfire, where you had to light up bombing sounds and other things that married in with the score. And again, all in support of the storytelling that, the, that your interviews did, and the way you cut the interviews together with that stuff. But let's talk for a minute about, the, the, I, I get some of the archival photographs um, from Faye and other things, but some of the most brutal Nazi treatment somehow is photographed, and you got that. And a lot of the moving footage, where did the moving footage come from? Yeah, well one of the things that I worked so hard to do throughout the film was, you know, I wanted the film to represent always the point of view of the partisans. So as I crafted and mined the archives that were out there, it was always like to, to make sure that we weren't looking at things from the point of view of the Nazis, unless that was the point of view in the moment of the story. And so what happens in this film, and I think it's cumulative, is you actually begin to feel like you're them. So three quarters of the way through the film, I don't know, it sort of starts to feel like, you, you sort of have that, that cinematic feeling like, oh my god, I'm really in this film. And even though it's a documentary, and I think that the reason for that and how it's successful is that even though it's the archival footage, I never pull you all the way back. I don't, I don't really take you out. Even the shots, even the aerial shots, you're really looking up at the belly of the airplanes. You're never above them. And so it's always like the stuff coming down. And so I tried to kind of keep you narratively within that frame. And even the depth of field. So when the girls are at the pits and they're dressed, it's like you're standing there with them. And that was very, very important to me. So. The archival was thousands of hours of culling the most brutal, horrid, <laughs> absolutely horrific images imaginable. And not that I was trying to sugarcoat anything that you saw, but I really wanted to make it so what you saw kept you within the frame of the film, kept you within the story. And so that was really deliberate. I mean, we mined archives to get to the nuts and bolts in Lithuania and Belarus and Russia pre nightmare um, current situation, Poland and all the partisans themselves had like film clips and different stories that they had had over time that you know they would have collected to tell their own story. So yes. it, was, it was an international global expedition <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was really something and well, I, 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 I can't say enough about it, and I would love to talk more about it, but we don't have that much time, but I'd love to have some questions from the audience right, right there. The, the essence of where I delved into getting to know them and where my focus was for the film was to really try to back into understanding how it was possible to become 
a member, so to speak, right? I mean, we make it sound like a club, but you know how how it was that a person could escape and become part of an active resistance, and what it was like to literally go through those steps. And I think in my goal of making the film was I really wanted people to walk away thinking, huh, who would I have been? Like, what would I have been capable of doing? Because I had always thought, oh, I would have, I wouldn't have, I'm rough and tumble, you know, I would have kicked it. And then after d working on the film and, and being part of the journey of this discovering, I realized I, no way, I wouldn't have left my son on that train by themselves or my daughter. I would not have left my parents, you know. I, I would have believed in humanity, actually. That's what I would have done. I would have, I would have been blindsided by the inhumanity. And, um, and I think that my goal in making the film and, my, and when I was interviewing people was to really understand that consciousness, that conscious shift of how do you do what you do? And what I learned, and I will answer your question in my own kind of way, but it was like you had to, Every partisan that I talked to had escaped death a couple of times. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to run to the forest and be a partisan. No. It was every single person had not only witnessed a brutality that was inconceivable, so they had to make that first conscious shift in their mind, but then they escaped death, usually twice, before they actually became partisans, right? And so there's a bit of that in the film. I mean, Gertie, everybody's dead, right? She would have been dead, but who knows? The universe had a different plan for her. Faye Shulman, her family's dead. So every single one of them, there was more than one instance that they would have passed, but it just didn't happen that way. So by the time the opportunity came for them to potentially leave, escape, become, it was, it, they had already, witness the inconceivable, and so that decision became something very different. I think the reason that's important to me, and that I made it important in the film, is because it was nearly impossible. And it was important to me because when I set out to make the film, I thought, why the hell do I know about this? I'm smart. <laughs> I'm smart, I'm Jewish, I have survivors of my family, how do I not know this story? And what I realized was, because it actually wasn't the story of the Holocaust, it's a story through which we can better understand the Holocaust. And I love this portal, especially for young people, especially for next generation, especially even for me, you know, to be able to enter into this history through this lens of resistance, through this lens, and through this intimacy of the last telling where people reveal things they never shared before, and you can feel it, that's palpable. And so through that, we have this incredible opportunity to carry this story forward. In terms of answering your question, it's not truly mine to answer, but I can tell you that everybody you saw in the film was still viscerally experiencing that which happened over 75 years ago. So I can only imagine what it's like for them other hours of the day and other moments in time. That's it. Uh, I think one more question, right over here. I think that all over the world we know that there's brutality and injustice and that there are innocent people caught, they're just caught. They're innocent people and they're caught in a firestorm. And I think that through learning about this film, it allowed me to connect with all the people of the world who are caught in a firestorm and reinstill in me my dedication to making sure that all people are protected and that we do, we do need to be vigilant and that anti-Semitism, as we've seen of recent, is rearing its head in ways that I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. And I'm glad that we have this film now because I think it's important. I think it'll help people understand what what's really at stake. And at the same time, 
I think that it's just urgent that we stick together as a species. And yeah. I hope that this film brings that together too. I, th I think that you've done a marvelous job of that. And we do have to wrap up now, but I want to tell you one thing. Um, this, this film has already had a lot of success and it's, it's going to continue to have success. But all you Academy voters out there, it has just qualified for the Academy Awards. So. It's true. It's official. It's official. So uh, when you get those SAG screeners and you're yeah. supposed to make your, uh, make your votes, just make your votes count, all right? So, right. Thanks, uh, th everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a wonderful film.